Welcome brothers, I'm JK Amazie, head coach and founder of the Porn Reboot System. You can learn more about us by visiting us at elevatedrecovery.org. Now if you're a man who is struggling with an out of control behavior with pornography, masturbation, or some other sort of sexual behavior, I release videos four times a week every week on this YouTube channel. And I highly recommend that you go ahead and subscribe and also click on the little bell icon so that you can receive notifications each time I release a video. Today we're going to be speaking about pastors or religious leaders who are addicted to pornography. And if you're watching this and wondering if this YouTube channel has suddenly taken a turn for the religious, you couldn't be more wrong. The first thing I want to make clear is that I am not religious at all. However, I do have a lot of respect for religion and we have a lot of clients who are religious men and I truly believe that their faith is one of the things that has helped them to overcome their porn addiction. That's the first thing I want to put out there. So why am I talking about pastors? Well, I'm speaking about pastors because I work with a lot of pastors. I work with a lot of religious leaders from different religions. And I also work with leaders of influence. And what I mean by this is individuals who are looked up to, individuals who are seen as a father figure, individuals who are seen as special because there's some sort of information or expertise that they possess that other people may not have access to. So as a result, they're held in high esteem or maybe even placed on a pedestal the way many pastors are. So a lot of pastors work with me because number one, I'm not religious. They are looking to work with somebody who's not going to judge them, whom nobody can guess that they are working with this man and who is also able to guarantee that they are going to end their out of control behavior so that they can go back to their congregation they can go back to the people who trust them knowing that they have controlled their behavior without the risk of being exposed now i'm not here to argue with anybody about the ethics of that all i know is that they come to me for help and i help them there's no judgment here not based on your religion, not based on your status, not based on your sexual orientation. The first thing I want to address is why pastors end up in a situation where they're struggling with an out of control behavior and it becomes this huge secret that prompts them to get to the point that they seek out somebody like me to help them control their behavior. Now the first thing that I've noticed from my professional experience working with religious leaders is that some of them believe that the vows that they take for their vocation or the vocation itself is actually going to be enough to help them to control their out of control behavior. Much like some religious men believe that marriage is going to help them control their behavior with pornography. And if you're a man who's in a relationship or who was in a relationship and still struggles with an out of control behavior, you know that couldn't be further from the truth. Right? Marriage or a relationship, no matter how high in esteem it is held within your religion or culture, just because it is something that is respected and something that is seen as sacred, it doesn't mean that your addict or your addiction cares. It doesn't. You're still going to slip. So in the same way, many religious leaders felt that, hey, you know what, if I do this, the discipline that's required, the boundaries that are required by this vocation, and the responsibility I'm going to have are going to be enough. And that's for men who do this as a vocation. But in reality, many pastors and religious leaders had what we could call a calling, so to speak, right? Which means that there was a specific purpose for them doing this. They felt a very strong urge. You could say it was divine. It was something that was a seed that was planted in them. But either way, many of them feel a very strong call or purpose to minister to others, to help others, to lead others, to break down their religious book to others. Or many of them were born or groomed to have a talent that was just perfect for sharing and spreading whatever their religion is. And in most cases, it is Christianity. The one thing about a calling is that when you have this strong pull and purpose to reach out to many people and influence them and help them in whatever capacity, 
it is something that requires a certain level of self-awareness and a certain level of emotional maturity. And what I've noticed in my nine years of working with religious leaders is that many of them accepted this calling before they were able to develop that emotional maturity and self-awareness. And this is one of the reasons why they struggle a lot. Over time, I also found that there are several things, several experiences which make a porn addicted pastor. Again, just so you are aware, you can apply the term pastor to any individual of influence. So if you are a person who is equal parts in whatever role you have, if you are viewed as a coach, if you are viewed as a father figure, if you are viewed as a mentor, if you are viewed as a therapist to people, a leader of sorts, a wise man. So if your role has an aspect of all of these things, then this applies to you as well. The first thing I've noticed is a lot of pastors who struggle with an out-of-control behavior with pornography find it very hard to differentiate between shame and guilt. And I've spoken about this before. Guilt is when you say that I've done a bad thing, right? I feel guilty about it, I did a bad thing, or I made a mistake. Shame, on the other hand, is where you identify with that thing you did. I am a bad person, not a person who did a bad thing. Or I am a mistake, not just a person who made a mistake. And that confusion usually leads to a tremendous amount of shame over time, which leads to something else, which is a very strong need to care for others more than they care for themselves which means that this religious leader experiences a lot of shame he doesn't know how to deal with it but his self-worth is derived from how many people that he can help so if he can help more people overcome their issues if he can counsel them if he can help them fix their problems if he can bring clarity to their lives if he can bring peace if he can even make them happier he feels that, hey, I am a better person. But it never works, it's never enough because he's already identified himself as the mistake, as the bad person. And thus, all he's doing is putting a band-aid on his problem. Now, you might be wondering, well, this is somebody who might be somebody you look up to, this is somebody who has a lot of experience and results helping people, how is it that he can't see what sounds like a very simple issue in his life? Well, the truth is many of us, you guys might know this, that we're very good, most human beings anyway, are good at seeing other people's problems, but not great at seeing their problems. Myself, for instance, I'm good at seeing other people's problems, but I never assume that I'm an expert at seeing my own problems. So I have coaches that I work with. I also have people that I work with who can analyze me, who can show me where I'm making mistakes because it's like kind of like if you stink, if you have bad body odor, most times you don't know if your breath stinks, you can't smell it. The same thing with your problems. The second way that a porn addicted pastor becomes a porn addicted pastor is unfortunately through abuse. Again, these are things that I've noticed through my years of working with both pastors, religious leaders from different religions as well, as well as leaders of influence. And I've noticed that many of them who were physically abused, let's say they were hit by their father, an uncle, a guardian of some sort, they have a lot of repressed anger. But their way of dealing with this repressed anger is to put out this very pacifist, gentle personality or external demeanor, right? So they're very peaceful and gentle people. But as you get to know them better, you notice that there's a little bit of a bite that comes behind their sarcasm or their humor usually has an edge, right? So sometimes they'll say something, maybe in a meeting or in a group setting, and you go like, okay, like, there was like a little bit of an edge to that. Did he mean that? Probably not, right? So that's how they typically express it. Unfortunately, in some cases, with physical abuse comes abandonment, which means that at some point in their life, they felt that they were abandoned by somebody who was important to them or somebody who was very important to them in the foundational years of their life. Maybe there was divorce. You're very attached to your mother, but she was separated and a stepmom came into your life, that sort of situation. Now, a lot of people who have abandonment in their past are also very good at being alone because typically during those moments of abandonment you were alone 
you got used to being alone and that's where the feeling of abandonment actually grew. Unfortunately, you would point it to pastors, leaders, men of influence, they still have that habit of being alone and unfortunately they are able to justify it by their vocation which means that they can say like you know I use this time to pray to be in communion with God to meditate to reflect to study the Bible or a holy book more when in reality they are doing those things but they're also doing the same things they did when they experienced their abandonment when they were alone they're acting out they're viewing pornography. They're engaging in other compulsive behavior in order to medicate their issue. Another thing which makes a porn addicted pastor that I've noticed over the years is some form of sexual abuse. And if this form of sexual abuse was perpetrated by an adult, a person who was seen to be in a position of authority, who had power, who knew what was best, and who maybe told them that it was okay and it was right and had some sort of power over them that prevented them from sharing it with other people. It is interesting to note that it is often seen manifesting itself between a pastor and his congregation, between a leader and a person who is on his team who looks up to him. Now, you know, when you hear about these scandals of the married pastor or the pastor who's been having multiple affairs with members of his congregation, it often seems like something consensual. But when you really dive into it, you realize that if this pastor was a regular Joe, another member of the congregation, somebody from outside the church, somebody who didn't have that power, somebody who wasn't looked up to like a father, a leader, or even a direct conduit to God, this would not have happened. He happened to have the power, he happened to be in the right position, he had the status that put him in a position where he could seduce another member of the church, right? And it's also not unusual for people to be attracted to individuals who have power, individuals who have charisma. Often when we dive deeper into the situation which occurred, we find that it is almost a replay of what happened to them when they were growing up. Often individuals who have gone through some sort of trauma try to regain control of the trauma by perpetrating it on others or by putting themselves in a situation where that could have happened, but now they have more control over it. The third way that porn addicted pastors, leaders, or men of influence are created is through what I call religious abuse. Now this is something that doesn't just affect pastors, it also affects leaders and men of influence who have a very strong religious background. What I mean by religious abuse is definitely not a blanket statement on religion. It's just something I've noticed professionally that when a porn addicted pastor is raised in a culture, a society, or a household slash family that is strictly religious, he sometimes feels inferior because he is seen as sinful. This means that while there were other ways that those around him could have raised him or maybe shown him the right way to do things, religion was used most of the time. So I remember growing up and I was in a similar situation, which is probably why I'm not religious right now, but I was raised in a situation where there were certain things that I was told to do, but nobody ever explained why. So the morals of not doing that thing were never broken down for me. I was never told why I shouldn't do that. The only reason I was told why was like, if you don't do this and if you don't do this and if you do this, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to a place where you're going to be punished for all eternity. And it started innocently enough, right? From little things as kids, like if you don't do this, then you know, this person's gonna come get you. And that's normal. I think that's a cultural thing to kind of scare kids into compliance. But as I got older, the whole fire and brimstone thing became so much more serious, right? The idea that only a select few were going to be taken away to this special place and that everybody else was going to suffer and that you had to work very, very hard to be among these chosen few. Now, I was growing up and as a kid, I was just like, okay, so there are so many people in the world and I would ask questions like, well, how many people are going to go? But whatever the answer was, it was always that it was only going to be a few people. And so the pressure to not be sinful, the pressure to wash myself of my sins, the pressure to be good was overwhelming. But we're human. We can't be perfect. 
And at every moment, I found myself doing something that was sinful, or I was told was sinful. And even when I felt I was almost perfect, it was only a matter of time before someone who was religious told me that you're not perfect, right? Like you were already born in sin and you need to work even harder to be pure and good person. So overall, personally, I felt very manipulated. Now, I know there might be some armchair therapist there who would want to psychoanalyze me in the comment section and educate me more about why I feel this way and all these different things. It doesn't matter. I am who I am today. But the point is this. The pastors whom I worked with who ended up in this situation were overwhelmingly men who felt very inferior because of this really strict religious upbringing. They also had a tendency to be very moral and rail against different sins. So it's almost cliche that the pastor who was known for railing against infidelity and speaking up against homosexuality, speaking up against adultery and fornication. It's almost cliche that they're the ones who make the news, right? That their wife ends up in a situation that involves adultery. They end up confessing that they have a porn addiction and there's one scandal or the other. It happens so often. Let's not even begin speaking about the Catholic Church, their priests, and what goes on there. We don't need to go into that. But these are some of the ways that I've noticed that a porn addicted pastor comes to be. Later on this week, I'm going to be speaking a little bit more about this. I'm going to be talking about how a porn addicted pastor can best reboot. And I'm also going to speak about how porn addicted pastors end up still having influence and charisma, power, and in many cases, success when they are severely addicted to some form of an out of control behavior. And what I mean by this is, you might be wondering, like, you know, I struggle with staying focused. I struggle with building my business. I struggle with getting clients. I struggle with intimacy with my wife. I struggle with social anxiety. How is it that these individuals are able to still have influence, have mega churches? How is it that these men of influence who are not pastors, but have similar characteristics to a pastor, are able to be productive, able to go out there and speak and attract people to them, yet they are really addicted to pornography? It's very interesting and I'm going to be sharing it with you later on during the week. I'm JK, your brother in the struggle. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Now, whenever you're ready, there are a couple of ways I can help you and your out of control behavior with pornography and masturbation. The first way is to download a free copy of my ebook. It is called Confessions of a Porn Addict, Seven Secrets of Porn Free Men. And brother, this is the roadmap to ending your behavior. Within it are the steps that my clients who've been free for pornography for over five, six, and even seven years have used to control their behavior. The second way that I can help you is to join my free Facebook group. Now, if you are looking for a community, if you are looking for accountability, if you are looking for a safe space where you can speak about your porn addiction, about something that you've kept secret for a very long time, a place where nobody is going to judge you, where you're going to be encouraged and put on the right path, then this is the group for you. There's a link in the description below this video, both to download the book and to join my free Facebook group. And if you're a man who's at a point where you know you can't do this alone, you've tried different things, you've tried 12 steps, you're in therapy, you've spoken to a psychiatrist, you've done all sorts of things, but you're still not able to control your behavior and you're looking for a system you're looking for something that is predictable something that is reliable something that is consistent within a community where they are actually recovered men not recovering men men who have rewired their brain men who have gone through the year two years three years and even more who do not view pornography and who do not masturbate then you might be a good fit for one of our coaching programs. Now, I'm very picky about who joins the coaching program. For me, it's very important that I am a part of the process, that I speak to you, that I know who you are. So the best way to apply for this is to click on the link in the description below this video, get on a call with myself or a member of my team. By the way, all members of my team who you speak with have overcome their out of control behavior as well. Schedule a call and find out if you're a good fit. Even if you're not a good fit, at the very least, you'll come away with a plan that you can use moving forward.
Thank you for watching once again, and I'll speak to you later on in the week.